three, two, one, go. Okay. Plaunda Baub, um, a close up connected to give in Gwemerna, Gwemerna, me at Nauma, in a focusia roll of a block or of a cloister I know with a few with the Antatilatian, a man Henry. Good afternoon. We will focus on the role of employers within the new construction qualifications here in Wales. It's the 23rd of March 2022, and it's a glorious day here on the outskirts of Cardiff. Hopefully, it's as nice the way you are. Um, to briefly introduce myself, I'm Ivan Glynn, and I'm the director of the Federation of Master Builders uh, here in Wales. Uh, before I go on to introduce the speakers, I would like to please just run a couple of uh, polls on questions linked to today's uh, subject matter. So, firstly, um, from one to five, can you tell us how would you rate your understanding of the employer's role within the new construction qualifications here in Wales? From one, completely understand them, to five, not a clue. Okay, excellent. Um, so the results are in. So we've got 36% uh, stating they don't understand them at all. And uh, 29% cents for fairly, well, I was going to say on, on the subject, but yeah, um, not a great grasp. Uh, three in the middle, 29 cents. Um, and then seven percent are very confident. Um, but luckily, there is no one that can pick him, so there's a use, use of you being there, which is which is good news. Okay, so on to the kind of second uh question I wanted to ask today it was just around uh apprentices and, and how many of you intend to take on an apprentice uh within the next year? Just a simple yes or a no. Excellent. So around 70% of you do intend to take on the apprentice this year. And then 30% uh, don't intend to take on the apprentice this year. But that's useful in terms of obviously with the new um, qualifications um, now in place and some of them going to soon to come on, uh, soon to come live. Obviously, um, those 70% will be kind of using these new qualifications. So that's good news. Okay. Um, so today's session will cover the new um, construction qualifications and the role of employers within the new system. Since September 2021, uh, new qualifications are being taught in Wales. Um, they are being staged. So you know, some of them are, are coming on board uh, in September. Uh, this year, um, and predominantly today, uh, we will be talking about uh, the level three uh, qualifications that go live in um, this September. Um, the new qualifications have been described as the biggest shake up to the qualifications uh, in this sector for a generation, uh, with the aim to streamline skills, to raise standards, and better meet the needs of employers here in Wales. City and Guilds and EEL are the sole providers of the qualifications. We at the FMB were consulted throughout the process and we are very pleased to see the enhanced role that employers have in the delivery of apprenticeship qualifications. It's quite a, um, it's quite a step change. Apprentices uh, will only qualify in the future with the approval of their employer. Today's presentation will take approximately half an hour or so and there will be 10 minutes uh, to field questions at the end. Feel free to make use of the chat function for your questions as the presentation takes place, or, or you can do so at the end, whichever works for you. So now to introduce the speakers, uh, we have Anhara Dwight Bingham, who is the Policy Stakeholder and Partnership Manager at City and Guilds, and Ian Roberts, 
the technical advisor for construction, also at City and Guilds. So over you to over to Alhara Amir. Thank you. Thank you, so thank you very much um, for the invite this afternoon to, to introduce the new qualifications and the employer's role within these new qualifications. Not sure if you can see the screens yet. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So thank you for the introduction, Ivan. Um, just the quick agenda then, I um, just go through what we'll be going through with you today. Um, Eva's already done the welcome introduction. So, and then we will be looking at why these transformations have happened. Eva just mentioned it quickly now. We'll have a look at the level three qualification content and then the structure of the units along with a summary of assessments. And we could take a deeper look then at the employer confirmation guide and your role as an employer within these new qualifications. We'll then take a look at the learning resources that are available for you before moving on to the next steps. And as Ivan said earlier, we have got a, a chance for you to ask us any questions at the end. And there you go, there's so myself and Harad, as um, Ivan said, I'm the Policy Stakeholder and Partnerships Manager for City and Girls for the Nations. And I'm sure you're all familiar with Ian Roberts, who's the Technical Advisor for Construction at City and Girls. Actually, Pam will trust now with already dig with but, uh, so the way of this, this transformation happened with the new qualifications. So back in February 2018, Qualifications Wales launched the Building the Future um, review where they did a sector review of qualifications and the qualification system in construction and the built environment in Wales. They found from the from the findings, they found that the, the if there was inconsistent um, assessments throughout the, the the process. Then they found that the, the the complexity of the qualifications there was too many qualifications and the assessments weren't very clear. And as a result, they decided that there needed to be a more coherent role within the qualifications and skills and qualifications to meet meet the skills needs of the people for Wales. And as Ivan mentioned, the, the new suite of construction and BSc qualifications are now being managed by City and Guilds and EAL. On this slide, it just shows you the qualification framework. So from September 2021, there's been a new GCSC in built environment. In September 2022, the new um, AS and A level in built environment will be launched. And from last September, the foundation core progression have been launched and, and these have been successfully been taught now throughout the colleges and centres in Wales. So you've got a foundation in construction and building services engineering, a core qualification in construction and building services engineering, a progression qualification in construction and a progression qualification in building services engineering. And then from actually it's actually from August this year, there will be a brand new level three in construction and a brand new level three in building services and engineering as well. You can see from that chart exactly which awarding body owns which qualification. And this webinar will focus on the level three qualifications only. So on this slide, it just shows you some questions you may have regarding the new qualification. So what does the qualification cover? At the new level three qualification in construction and BC, the learners will develop their knowledge, skills and understanding in either a construction or BC trade contained in, within the NOS. Learners will complete two core units covering the relevant sector and practice in a sector within Wales. The qualification is aimed at learners aged 16 and over currently working in the construction or the building services engineering industry. They're designed for learners who have either passed the level two foundation in construction and building services engineering qualification or will be completing their core foundation qualification learning and assessments while in their apprenticeship. And then also a suitable for learners who have completed the level two progression in either construction or building services engineering qualification. The qualification is designed to be completed on a part-time basis within the apprenticeship. 
Before the assessments, learners must first demonstrate their performance and capability to the satisfaction of their employer. And then on completion, the qualification will provide learners with the skills and knowledge required for the learner to be capable of working in their chosen trade across the UK. I'll now pass you over to my colleague Ian, Ian Roberts, who will take you through the next few slides. Yeah, Ian. Thank you, Anne Harrod, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I trust you're all keeping well, and thank you for attending this evening's webinar, and especially for inviting us along this evening to present to you. Before I begin, I'd just like to mention that I am working from home, and therefore I apologise in advance if there's any background noise that may interfere. Next slide, please. Before I actually begin this, I would like to take you this opportunity to inform you that if you would like to take a deeper dive, deeper dive into what I'm going to present, you can by um, reading through the relevant documentation, especially the qualification handbook and the assessment pack, which is located on the Skills for Wales website. But here we can see there's three areas, three main qualifications. We've got the foundation and the core. We've got the progression. And the one we're going to be talking about this evening, which is the level three qualification in construction. In the foundation, you will see various trade areas underneath. And this is mainly for full-time learners. And the core qualification, which is on a similar pathway, which is for apprentices who will actually start the course. Then they would move on to the progression, full-time course. Now, the progression is exactly the same as what an apprentice would actually follow through. So there you've got the standardization across the two areas. And then we can see the level three, the 11 trades that are included within that particular qualification in construction. And then you can see this four building services engineering that we will be providing an overview during this presentation. Although the consortium is working collaboratively together, we have highlighted under each title, the awarding organization was responsible for example, City and Gills are the awarding organisation for the foundation qualification and construction within the progression and apprenticeship qualification and EAL for the building services engineering. Next slide, please. Here we can see an overview of the qualifications, including the total number of guided learning hours to deliver the qualification, which is a mixture from a training provider and especially within industry. So here I'm gonna just select the site carpentry. You can see there is six common core units and eight trade units covering all aspects of the skills and knowledge. And then the hours allocated to the assessment, which is 71 in total. So if we selected, for example, roof slating and tiling, there is six common core units, and these are the six same common core units, whichever trade area that learner would cover exactly the same. And then the relevant trade units in Ruslan and Thailand, the seven, and then you've got the forms of assessment and the total guided learning hours. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now I'd like to just briefly touch on the unit structure. What I'm trying to do is just give you a little flavor of what is actually happening or gone off behind the scenes to develop these qualifications. So you know what the structure looks like. So you've got a little bit more knowledge and information if you require. Next slide, please. Okay, so now what we're gonna be covering is here. So we've got the learning outcomes, which groups together the chunks of the practical skills and or knowledge and are presented as the result of the learning process. And this is what a learner must understand or be able to do following the teaching and learning, whether it's in industry or within a, a training provider environment. Then we've got the assessment criteria. This breaks down the learning outcome into smaller areas to be covered. And these criteria are what will be assessed in connection with the learning outcome. And then the range. This contains the information on the breadth required for specific assessment criteria. We have to remember the range is not an exhaustive list 
as there may be other examples that fit within the topic area. Next slide, please. Here we can see what an example of a unit looks like. So if you did look at the qualification handbook, you'd see the units broken down as follows. And it's very similar to what you have been, or you may have been used to seeing previously. All of the units, whether mandatory or optional, are of the same design. This identifies the unit number and title, which is unit 301 and it's understanding the construction practices within Wales. This is a level three, and also is 40 guided learning hours to deliver that. And then you can see the brief description. And this is what the unit is about. And here it, it is an opportunity for learners to explore and understand the wide and changing scope of the construction sector in Wales, looking from pre-1919 practices all the way to the current future developments. And the learning outcome, which we have covered, which I've mentioned previously, which is the number of learning outcomes will depend on the very, on the, depending on the unit as we move forward. Next unit, next slide, please. Now we're gonna start a little bit more in depth on the summary of assessments. And this is really where industry now has got to start playing that bigger part and we're playing along with this as we're moving forward. It is crucial that we have employers buy into this and you'll see the reasons why. Next slide, please. The level three qualification, no matter which trade area you're taking, whether it's building services or construction, <clears throat> the first one is the on-screen assessment. A learner will have to complete multiple choice questions. And these are externally set and externally marked, and as an overall weighting towards the overall qualification of 20%. You can see here that this will include two tests, test one and test two, which I will come back to further on. Then we have the practical project. The practical project is covering the trade area that the learner is working towards. And this is carried out within industry. And this has got to be set in agreement with the employer and will be assessed by the assessor employed by the training provider. This will then be externally quality assured and as an overall weighting of 60%. And the quality assurance is carried out by a member of the regulatory body who will be occupationally competent in construction or the building services engineering sector. Now we have a new one a new method of assessment that centres are not too familiar with. And this is called the professional discussion. And this is one externally set and will be externally marked by a trade specific member of the awarding organisation with an overall weighting of 20%. We will be going through each method of assessment in the up and coming slides. But what we mean by a member of the awarding organisation, they will be trade specific to the trade area that that learner is working towards. Next slide, please. Within this slide now, I would like to go through in more depth each method of assessment. <clears throat> the on-screen assessment contains two tests, test one and test two and can be taken at any stage in the assessment process. Although this is on demand and completed at any time, it is advisable that the learner does not, that the learner completes prior to the professional discussion. The test one on average contains 45 questions and the learner will have 70 minutes to complete. Now, this may have been if the learner has come through the full time where at this moment in time and gone through the foundation, the progression may have completed the test one at the progression while working towards the progression qualification. Because it is exactly the same test as what a learner working directly onto the apprenticeship will will attain and achieve at the same time. Which will be during their second year. Test two then is completed in their final year and on average is 44 questions and there's a timing of 70 minutes. 
So the learner will have 70 minutes to complete moving forward. The practical project is made up of three elements. It commences with planning, it's then the performing, which is the actual doing of the project, and then the evaluating. So they've got to evaluate how they carried out the project. Those are the three main elements or the three ingredients of the project. The project has got to be carried out in the realistic working environment. They can select from a number of tasks that are outlined within the assessment pack. So the employer would agree with the learner with the support of the college or the training provider, which activities that learner or opportunities that learner would have to complete them activities. But they cannot exceed any more than four based work activities or four work based tasks to enable that learner to attain and achieve the project. The assessor then employed by the training provider will carry out assessment visits which will include a minimum of three visits. These three visits have got to purely focus on while the learner is doing the practical project. Not just to go out there and have a chit chat with the learner or the employer, but to purely focus and mark what is actually being carried out regarding the practical project. Yes, it will take some planning and some coordinating, but that's where the assessor will have to try and communicate with the employer accordingly. The professional discussion will be carried out by a member of the awarding organisation. And that person will be occupationally competent in the field that the learner is working towards. This will be carried out in a one-time sitting and can be either virtual or face-to-face. -face. The professional discussion will last no more than 40 minutes with an additional five minutes allowed to complete the final question and will be graded past the distinction. There is also an opportunity for the learner to carry out this in the Welsh language if they deem, if they deem to do so. The learner will need to demonstrate their knowledge, understanding and performance from the occupational standards relevant to their trade. They will also be required to reflect on the practical project they have completed within their discussion. And the professional discussion can only take place once the learner has completed the project and the employer confirmation guide, which we'll go through very shortly. Next slide, please. <clears throat> can you just go back one, please? I think you skipped one, thank you. If you weren't already aware, there is no NVQ within the new level three qualifications. Learners, however, still have to gain the skills and knowledge within industry to carry out and fulfill their role within the construction industry. Within this slide, we can make reference to the employer confirmation document. And now this will help support the learner in meeting the qualification requirements and attaining their relevant competency card. The guide which I will go through provides guidance to employers and training providers on how the occupational competency statements set by industry have been met. This document when completed will provide employers, federations and industry the confidence that the learner has provided evidence of meeting the occupational competency statements. And then the overall qualification will be graded pass merit or distinction to help differentiate the achievement between learners. Provisional grades for the practical project will undergo internal and external quality assurance. The professional discussion, the external assessor will confirm the grade with the learner. And then the, finally, the overall grade for construction will be issued by City and Gills and for building services will be done by EAL, our partners. <clears throat> Learners 
can reset assessments or make a resubmission when they fail to achieve a pass grade in any of the assessments. Guidance on the reset, etc., can be found in the assessment pack, which is located on the Skills for Wales website if you're interested and you'd like to go through that in more depth. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, I'd really like to go through now is the employer confirmation guide. And this is where you will see and note that there's a lot more work that's got to be carried out to support the learner working collaboratively together with the training provider to ensure that this document is going to be completed. Next slide, please. The employer confirmation is part of the learner journey and will help strengthen the relationships between employers, centres and the learner. This is only part of that learner journey and the process will enhance the employer role in the delivery of the new apprenticeship, qualifications in the construction and built environment sector. As we are all aware, the learner will spend a considerable amount of time in the realistic working environment. And the purpose of this confirmation sign off is to capture the activities and provide stakeholders, including trade bodies, confidence that the learner is occupationally proficient and has covered the full range of the relevant standards to allow the learner to progress to the final part of the assessment process which will be the professional discussion. Although there is no NVQ within the new apprenticeship model, a learner will still provide a range of evidence that allows the center to check the employer confirmatory sign-off is valid. Upon successful completion of the robust assessment process and the confirmatory sign-off, a learner will then be in a position to retain, or I should say attain, the relevant skills card. We are aware that the employer confirmation process is new and undoubtedly will raise a few concerns. The consortium will provide centres and employers with instructions and the requirements for completing this process. Information is already outlined within the, in the employer confirmation guide which will be further communicated at our centre and employer events. We are currently in the process of planning and scheduling when these one hour webinars will take place. <coughs> Excuse me. And as soon as we have that information available, as we've normally done, they will be placed on the Skills for Wales website and we will be forwarding emails out to all stakeholders informing them of when they can commence and register on them accordingly. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Here we can see how working collaboratively, we can support the learner along their journey. That they were required to move forward and progress to their final assessment of that assessment process, the professional discussion. As you can see on the slide, by working together, employers and centres will provide opportunities that will allow the learner to gain valuable industrial experience and complete the activities outlined with the employer confirmation guide. <clears throat> Whether it be one, two or three employers the learner will work with throughout their apprenticeship, hence the reasons why we have made provision on the various forms for more than one employer to work on the documents. We have a considerable number of employers who work in line with the shared apprenticeship scheme. And this is the opportunity for that one document to pass between each employer. Work-based learning providers and centres will work with employers to guide and support to ensure the occupational competency statement log is being completed correctly. And as you can see, the pieces start to come together. And this is through working collaboratively together to ensure that that learner journey runs smoothly. Without this, then it will not accordingly. This is 
process is to ensure the learner is prepared for that final assessment when they meet the external assessor. As you can imagine, this certainly hasn't been a smooth journey, as change is always and sometimes very difficult to accept. We have engaged with a considerable number of stakeholders, including micro businesses, medium to large contractors, and federations, including colleges and private training providers. Next slide, please. <clears throat> What we're now going to do is start to look in depth into the employer confirmation guide. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the part that we would like you to play a significant part in, in completing to help support that learner through their journey. Within this slide, you can see a front page, and it's in Welsh and English because the document will be in both Welsh and English for people to select how they want to complete it. There's a contents and a section that is contained within the employer confirmation guide. Like I've mentioned, whether it be one, two or three employers, they will work with the learners throughout their apprenticeship. Hence the reasons why I've made that provision on the various forms. The employer confirmation guide will be trade specific and can be located on the Skills for Wales website. So when you go on the Skills for Wales website, and you click on the qualifications and then you click on documents, which will be clear for you to see, that's where these documents are currently located. The document will be in a writable PDF and can be completed either electronically or hard copy. If you wish to complete it in hard copy, you just need to print the document off from the website. Although the, the training provider will help support you in doing that accordingly. The employer confirmation document is the responsibility of the employer and the learner, working collaboratively with the learning provider. Although not part of the qualification, this has to be completed prior to the learner moving forward to complete that final assessment, which will be the professional discussion. Next slide, please. <clears throat> here you can see examples of Form A. And here you can see Section 1 is completed at the candidate, at apprentice, the name, the registration number, the qualification title, and the centre they're working in. So that first Section 1 will be completed at the commencement of the learner. So he knows, or so they know, who their employer is what centre they're working through and the qualification they're actually working towards as well as. Then you've got section two, which is completed by the employer when the learner has completed the relevant statement. For example, conform to general workplace health and safety and welfare. With what we've done here is as well, we've made the unit reference number because some employers are still used to understanding the unit numbers and the VR41s, for example. Now that number refers directly to the occupational competency statement set by industry that's outlined in the National Occupational Standards. You're working through that. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Well, thank you. Next section. That'll do fine. Thank you. Just go back a slide, please, now, because the third part didn't come up. Thank you. And finally, the section three, which is completed by the employer and the IQA. This is when all the statements outlined within Form B have been completed. And like we've said, there's more than one employer involved with the learner, then there's opportunities there for that employer to sign that. So that would be the authenticity and validation that that employer has stated the company name, the employer's name, or the employee's name, I should say, the position in the company and their signature. They would then initial it and date it accordingly. It's just to help validate the relevant documents. Next slide, please. Now we can see Form B. Now this outlines the units and activities 
a learner will have to complete. The more units the learner has, which I identified in earlier slides, for example, if they've got six uh, competency units to work towards, then them six units will be clearly identified here. But what you'll also see as well is an additional one regarding the learner's attitudes and behaviours. That again is something that the learner has got to provide evidence that they are proficient in. And it's only the employer that can decide whether or not that learner has got the relevant attitudes and behaviours as we're moving forward. Yes, at times there may be conflict, but hopefully that conflict can be ironed out between individual parties who's working together collectively on that. Next slide, please. <clears throat> what we've also got contained, <coughs> excuse me, in the uh, employer confirmation guide is an eight step guide. So when we look at this eight step guide, it's taking you as an employer, learner and training provider, the steps people will need to take. So starting from the beginning, where the apprentice secures employment and starts their learning journey, providers meet with employers to identify the range of tasks required to meet industry competency statements and the work-based project, opportunity to discuss that and work together, develop and agree quality assurance checks for the employer confirmation process, periodic reviews of the apprentice's progress and quality checks, evidence from industry, all the way through then to the final assessment, the professional discussion, to actually being able to comply and um, apply for their competency card. We are currently at this moment in time working on this eight step guide. And the reason we're working on this closely is to expand it. So it gives more guidance and support to employers as well as training providers. We are providing the same guidance and support to all stakeholders, including private training providers and colleges. This is about working together, collaboratively together to ensure that that learner journey is run as smooth as it possibly can. Yes, the learner will still have to gather evidence, but not in the form of a portfolio of evidence. There'll be further guidance in this particular document on the types of evidence that that learner will need to complete. So yes, you're gonna be seeing assessors from the college coming out to visit, <clears throat> but just purely to observe the activities carried out within that project. Not the day-to-day -day running or activities, that will be carried out by the employer, supporting that learner. And as soon as that learner is proficient in the activities, that's when the employer would tick and sign the relevant sections in this document. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Here you can see where we've added an opportunity for learners working on heritage that an employer may wish their learner to obtain above and beyond the man mandatory vocational skills. This is at the request of CABWE to ensure that nothing is missed when an opportunity arises. We can see the pathway, the unit title, and the unit number. Units highlighted in red are units that are not included in the current occupational competency statements. All the other units are included within the occupational competency statements for each trade. The units have been added to the relevant trade employer confirmation guide and will be optional. So if you are by any chance at that moment in time working on any part of this area, then please sign the relevant document in there to show that this learner has worked on heritage as they're moving forward. Next slide, please. Thank you. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now we're gonna to just touch briefly on, on resources. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we have various resources available for you to view if you wish. They are located on our Skills for Wales website. You'll find the qualification tab that will take you to all of our qualifications. And then you can locate the qualification handbook and employee confirmation guide and the assessment pack. 
I know it's not great bedtime reading, but if you do get an opportunity, please look at that and read through it accordingly. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so here we can see a brief overview of the, where the learner journey actually begins. If a learner is successful and gains apprenticeship or gains employment straight from school, they would con commence straight on to what they call the core qualification. It's exactly the same as the foundation qualification. The only exception is on the core qualification, they just do one trade area, which is the trade area they're working towards. Where a learner on a foundation full-time course will cover two trade areas to be able to move that forward. But what they didn't want to do was disadvantage learners who were doing full-time courses. So if you get a learner on a foundation course and then he's successful after 12 months getting employment, then they'd continue straight onto their apprenticeship and they can continue moving forward. Learner who's not successful would then have to continue on a second year full-time, which would be the progression qualification. But they're not being disadvantaged then because that progression qualification is practically the same as what that learner would do on their second year apprenticeship moving forward. It's the same test, same knowledge test as test one, and that's what they do moving that forward. But again, if they're still not successful, then they would then continue the progression and then hopefully then move on to the apprenticeship moving forward. Learners who are not ready yet on a, to continue on a, a foundation full-time course, and we do have them type of learners at this moment in time, then they would do a broad level one to get them prepared for the foundation. That would commence September 2022. And then you've got the dates then from 2023 all the way through to 2025, and it would continue from then on accordingly. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you. We will be continuing to deliver various short webinars up to one hour at a time to suit yourselves from four o'clock in the afternoon till half past seven in the evening. And these will commence in June. We will continue to send out updates via email. Please try to allocate time to read. And if you're not receiving, let us know. And we will add you to the emailing list. We have produced an additional enhanced guidance document to support employers on the new qualifications, which can be located on the Skill for Wales website. We will be attending and presenting at various employer events run by colleges, private training providers, federations, and various other bodies. What I would now like you to do is to pass you now back to Han Harrod. Thank you for now. Thank you, Ian. I think it's now going over to any questions, Ivan. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, can I just first of all say, uh, thank you, um, and Ian, thank you so much. That was really uh, insightful. Um, so, in terms of questions, we've got a couple of questions during the session uh, that I wanted to put to, to you, if I may. So, the first question is um, Who will be doing the on site assessment? That's over to you, Angharad, or Ian. Not sure if Ian's frozen. Either that, or he's, 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 <laughs> he's very still. <laughs> yeah, I think Ian's lost connection. Angharad, are you, are you able to address that question? Yeah, the on site assessment. Um... If I'm, I'm right in saying this now, the on-site assessment will be done by um, the, the the professional discussion will be done by the um, external assessor, and then the on-site assessment will be done by by the assessor. Okay. Thank I think you. I'm right. Um, I'll confirm with Ian because um, he's closer to the qualifications than I am. Okay. Thanks. Um, another question we had was uh, where are the employer confirmation guys located? And are they going to be electronically based or paper based? They can be found on the Skills for Wales website and they will be available to be printed, printed off or they'll be available electronically as well. 
So, and it's uh, you can see on the on the guides there that there was different columns for different employers. So, if there are some apprentices working with different employers, there's an opportunity there for every employer um, to fill in then their, their information on that apprentice just to tick the boxes. So, say for example, they're working out with some shared apprenticeship teams as a cover or apprentice, then every employer then can input into that apprentice's progress. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got a question from Anne Marie Gross. Uh, how will the grant scheme work? Currently, there are attendance grants by CITB and the achievement grant. Will this continue using the new route? Yes, I can answer that. Yes, they, they they will be still continued on the new on the new apprentices as well, the same as what they've done previously. Excellent. Um, next question. Even if they complete the foundation qualification in college, they haven't qualified, have they? So they can still do an apprenticeship as there are more qualifications that can be done in college. That's right. So with a foundation qualification, they to choose two trade areas. So the two trade areas would be dependent on the learner and the college, depending on the setting. And then if they did the foundation, then they've got the option of going on to progression qualification, where they choose one trade area, or they could go on and then go on to an apprenticeship and to be competent in their trade that way, or they can skip the progression if they've already had and secured an apprenticeship. So they can go from the foundation to the apprenticeship if they've secured an apprenticeship. Okay. Um, and the last question we have. Who does the professional discussion and where does it take place? The professional discussion will be done with um, an external assessor who's competent in the trade. And that will be done then at um, a, place in, in, um, a place of the learner and employer's um, choice and the college. Um, and it'll, it'll be done in, in one go then. It'll be done in, in one sitting. Okay, excellent. And that is all the questions then. Um, so just to kind of finish off, I just wanted to, again, I had a thank you, uh, uh, for that. Annie and Zong, well, those are not with us anymore, but just wanted to thank you again. Um, it, it, it was super insightful and, and hopefully um, all the attendees uh, found you. So I want to thank the attendees for coming along and hopefully um, you got something out of it. Um, I'd just like to kind of uh, promote some future webinars that we have. Um, if you go on our website, keep an eye on the events section of the website. We've got some really useful uh, webinars coming up. Um, there's one that's especially uh, useful, I think, coming up on the 30th of March on maximizing uh, your membership benefits. Um, that'll take place at 4.30 on the 30th of March. Uh, go on the website, you can register for that. Um, and just to explain, the, uh, this session has been recorded, so you will be able to accessing it um, on the members section of the website. But for now, um, thanks again and uh, enjoy the rest of the, of, of the evening. Bye -bye.